Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you, Sean, for scheduling us right after Alexander in a you know, 30 minute slot. Uh, we'll try to fit in there. Uh, no promises. That's the first thing I'm going to say. And the goal is to, to go through a little bit of what we've been doing on the Automotive SIG, what we're up to. Uh, you know, if you haven't heard about us, let us know. Uh, if you did heard about us, that was maybe last year at Santos Connect, so here's a refresh course. I'm Pierre Chibon, also known as Pingu. That's probably the name that most of you have heard about me before. I was in the Federal Infrastructure Team for a while. I moved to the automotive project at Red Hat about two years ago, and Eric joined Red Hat about two years ago? Uh, two and a half years ago. Kind of. yeah. So you, you were pretty much in the automotive uh, from, from the beginning then? Yep. Uh, so we both worked at Red Hat as, uh, in the automotive. So here's a map of things. This is a map that you're probably very familiar with. Uh, so just, you know, we are here. Just the, uh, I wanted the you are here question. I didn't find the right picture, but uh, we are basically here. So you know, you know the story, you know the front line, you know it goes from, from the open source project to Fedora to RHEL to, you know, through Santa Stream to RHEL. And then what you don't know is the new lines underneath that. So where we are is we are the automotive SIG. So we are just like any other Santa SIGs, except that instead of building on top of Santa Streams, we are building on top of a di distribution that's called the automotive stream distribution which, as the name indicates, is targeted to the automotive markets, to the automotive use case, is a derivative of the CentOS stream distribution, therefore the name, and is basically the upstream for the Red Hat in vehicle operating system, which is itself, you know, a derivative of the rail operating system. So we have this nice uh, quadrant here where everything leads to Rivos. All the roads leads to Rivos. Well, there was run, but then, you know, Rivos came. Um, so, we're here to talk a little bit more about the automotive SIG. There is one thing that we should, uh, we should explicit is uh, um, we don't expect the, the, the Red Hat in Vehicle pro uh, OS product uh, and you know, the automotive SIG uh, in, the, in, the in the same ID. It's like we don't expect to deliver nice ISO. There is, there is not gonna be, a, you know, a, you can here's, here's the image you can download about Rivos that you can go and play with it. Instead, the idea is that we deliver a set of packages and you get, to get, you get to build your image. And for this, we're using the tool that is underneath Image Builder, uh, but provides more flexibility than the blueprints that Image Builder allows you to do today. Uh, so that, that tool is called OS Build. Uh, so we have a number of uh, OS Build manifests. Uh, so OS Build is very much like the uh, M, um, MK ISO that we saw earlier today. Uh, you know, it's a tool that allows you to create a file system, an operating system image that you can then flash onto an SD card that you can then Convert it to a QCAO image that you can then make, you know, a, a base container image uh, out of it. Um, so, OS Build allows you, Image Builder allows you to do that. OS Build, which is the underneath layer, allows you to do all of this. And the idea that you know, OEMs, the automotive manufacturer, the people will be using Rivos will basically be downloading all the package for coming from uh, coming from us. They will be adding on top of it their own proprietary stack, and they will build and uh, they will assemble the final operating system image that then will flash on the system and then, you know, take to the road. So that's where we are. Um, Architecture-wise, uh, we are looking at H66 and AR64. There is a very strong push towards AR64 today. That's basically our current focus, but, you know, uh, most of our laptops still run H66 today, so that's why we have it. Uh, if you're looking, uh, you know, in the CentOS build system, if you're looking at, uh, you know, what the SIG does, you won't find any uh, X390X, for example, which we recently ha got asked about, uh, because it turns out an X390X server may not fit into a car. Like, maybe a truck, you know, but a car is, you know, still... <laughs> I, know, I know everything's bigger in the US, but, you know, still. <laughs> Um, there is one thing that we're keeping an eye on, though, is the, um, the you know, the RISC-5, uh, the RISC-5 um, rising. The, the RISC-5 architecture is an, is an interesting architecture. It probably has the potential of uh, being disruptive to this industry as well. Uh, it's something we're keeping an eye on, but so far, everybody's asking us for harm, so, you know, harm it is. And with this, I'll leave the ground to Eric for the next slides. Um, yeah, so we have people running on, um, AutoSD and all sorts of hardware for development purposes. But um, within the last few months, um, we've had a, a lot of um, involvement from Texas Instruments in um, the automotive SIG. Um, and they've been doing some great work upstreaming and standardizing their boot sequence. 
and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, th this is a new reference board. We're kind of recommending if if you're looking for a board just to hack on um, automotive stuff. Um, yeah, it's a useful board and it's very relevant to automotive because Texas Instruments are are actually um, putting automotive boards on the market. So, um, oh yeah, this is just uh, so so in AutoSD, um, it's very important in automotive to have kind of an immutability solution. So you, um, we don't have people hacking vehicles. Um, <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> no, no, stop laughing. We don't. <laughs> um, so just like um, other SIGs, um, like CentOS, Stream, CoreOS, um, we use OS3 for this solution, so it provides automatic uh, upgrades and rollbacks, um, provides health checking via Greenboot. Um, provide something I started calling, <laughs> we started calling directory-based AB updates rather than partition-based AB updates. Um, you can do Delta upgrades, it provides read-only file systems. Um, there's been some interesting work in a new file system called ComposeFS, which basically extends um, secure boot and integrity checking to the final root FS. And it also provides some OTA infrastructure for like base operating system components. Um, oh yeah, it's, so this is kind of a standard way how um, OS3 works. Um, so it's very simple. It's 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 AB updates. If if the boot fails several times, the boot counter decrements and eventually the boot is deemed as unhealthy and you automatically roll back to the to the last version. Um, and green boot is the health checking tool that basically marks a version as healthy or not. Um, this is something else we've noticed is kind of popular in the industry. Um, the last solution is, is definitely is something I kind of regard the primary solution, but this is an alternative approach that exists in in industry sometimes. Some automotive people, they prefer to um, not just roll back, but roll back into a slightly different user space environment. Um, so we have this functionality now where you can say, yes, roll back, but roll back into an alter alternative system D boot target which in this slide is rescue.target, but it could theoretically be any um, system D boot target if you wanted to write your own. Um, this is another feature um, we kind of added to OS3. So um, this kind of Android style bootloaders, they're, they're very popular in the automotive industry. So it's something we added support for upstream and OS3 and AutoSD. I should say compatibility. Auto <laughs> SD has compatibility for this as well. So these, these Android style bootloaders, they typically um, do partition based AB switching. So we support that. And then once we get to the root file system, OS3 um, uses directory based um, uh, AB switching. But as a user, a lot of this goes on under the hood. So you don't really notice. Um, yeah, I don't need to go into much more detail there. Feel free to ask questions. Um, so this is something else we've been working on in the SIG. Um, it's something called ComposeFS, and yeah, it's an opportunity, uh, opportunistically sharing verified file system. Um, it's included in the upstream Linux, it's the implementation is both in kernel space and user space, so that's all that's all upstreamed and it's available in Fedora and in AutoSD. Um, it builds on top of VeroFS and OverlayFS, um, as it and I, I kind of referenced this in a previous slide, but it, it enhances and it extends integrity checking and secure boot, uh, protects against things like hardware failure, data corruption. Um, so Alexander recently posted a blog post on that, and 
Um, if, if you're interested in this, I definitely recommend going to Alexander's talk, which is Saturday. Um, so this is another thing we've been working on the SIG. Um, our kernel boots like really quickly now, it's like under 200 milliseconds, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, back like when we started over two years ago, we were booting at approximately 1.6 seconds or so. So that's, that's a pretty significant um, difference there. Um, so how do we do this? We, we removed a lot of kernel modules, which uh, just aren't really relevant to automotive. We kind of changed a lot of things that are built directly into the kernel or if they're built as kernel modules. Um, in terms of decompression, we run an uncompressed kernel, an LZ4 compressed init RD, and a ZSTD. And we use ZSTD compressed kernel modules. So all the compression algorithms. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, if, if you're curious about why we chose those, the short version is um, we did a lot of benchmarking and this, this, was, the, this was the fastest combination that, suppo that supported all the various platforms. Um, we basically don't use gzip even because that's, even though that's widely compatible, um, it's decompression is slow so it's not really ideal for um, boot optimization. So we removed a lot of RPMs we don't need. We masked a lot of system D services, generators. We reduced logging. We, we removed a bunch of functionality from the inner RD, even bash, and even a lot of Drakewood stuff. At this point, Drakewood is pretty much just an inner RD builder. Um, but yeah, this could be a, a talk in itself, um, and it probably should be at some point. Um, this is just a small subset of the things we did because there's a lot of pressure to boot in like a handful of seconds in automotive. If you want to know more about that, blame Sean because we only have half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> this is something else we've been working on. It's something, it's, it's kind of related to the last slide. It's something called init overlay FS. Um, it's still in its like early versions. Um, so it's an alternate initial file system. Um, so its main advantage is it's, it reduces the dependency on like minimizing your initial file system because I regard it as both a scale and performance feature. I, I've shown this to a lot of people and they're like, wow, system D boots so much faster. I think actually the bigger picture with in it overlay FS is that um, you only pay for the bytes you use. So like if you have a massive initial initial file system, um, you only load the bytes as you actually as you actually use them. Because um, if you've ever worked in the init RD, you'll see there's lots of kind of like reinventing the wheel in terms of um, in the interest of minimizing. The in RD, and this is to help reduce the fear of um, using generic solutions in the um, in it RD. Um, and it's very simple how it works. Um, basically, do a double double switch route. So you boot into the in it RAM FS. All that does is initialize the storage. Um, but most of the initial file system stuff is in the init overlay FS. So then you run all that, and then you switch route again into the the root FS. Um, I'll hand you back to Pierre, actually. Pierre knows about this stuff. So now that we covered all the low-level one, uh, there is, we also did some things in the user space uh, model. Still on systemd, actually. And I'm looking this way because I know we have a systemd developer in the room. Uh, so one of the questions we have is, uh, OK, I have, I have one automotive, I have one compute unit in the car. And I want to be able to have multiple compute units in the cars. And who says multiple compute units means you know multiple services or services uh, designed to be spread across multiple compute units. And you suddenly need to have coordination. You need to be able to say, I want service A to start on on device A before service B starts on device B. And you know that go, that. When I'm just saying this, I mean, I can see it in your eyes, in your brains, even if your eyes are closed and you're snoring on the back. Uh, you're thinking Kubernetes. <laughs> you're thinking Kubernetes, you're thinking containers, you're thinking container orchestration, and you would not be wrong, except that we are 
talking about a car, an edge device that has limited capabilities, limited um, you know, hardware resources, and Kubernetes is not a lightweight application, it's not a lightweight framework. Um, it also comes to the fact that Kubernetes is built around an algorithm that is an eventual consistency approach where you describe the end state of your system and then the system moves towards that end state in a, in a sequence that you do not control. It's, you, know, you, can, you may ask it to do A, B, and C, and it may do C, B, and A, and it's still going to reach the end states, and you're good with that, but except the path that it took may not be the, the path that it took in production may not be the path that it took when you were testing these things in your CI system. And when you're talking about an automotive, an automotive uh, ecosystem, an automotive just in the road, you don't want to be in a situation where your system behaves differently in production, you know, on the highway in autopilot than it did in your CI system. You want to be able to reliably test every configuration and every pass that your code t took to be able to ensure that you know, the behavior is gonna be consistent between your testing and your production environment. Um, so we wanted to have something that was a lot more deterministic than the algorithm that's underneath Kubernetes. Um, there is also one tiny piece here which is not relevant for the automotive SIG per se, but which is relevant from a product perspective is you know, the, the automotive industry has a, co a concept of certification, an ISO, it's actually an ISO standard that's called function safety. And you want to be able to have functionally safe applications. And Kubernetes is a large and complex piece of software and Golang is a large and piece, uh, complex piece of software in itself. And making, you know, being able to do, to take Kubernetes and just even the Golang compiler through the functional safety certification is a large and complex process in itself. Um, so we try to look for a different approach here. And what we've landed on is basically an extension of systemd to be a cross node. Um, so that's, uh, that's a project I'm going to describe also a little bit in the next place. Uh, I'm going to skip the, the last uh, few slides. You may have heard about it before, about the name Irte. Uh, Irte means shepherd in German, and we thought it was a good name, except that it was already trademarked by a German company. So, you know, blue cheese it is. And if people have questions about that, I have an entire story about why the name came to be, but that's, you know, far after the talk. Uh, so how it looks like, it's very much like systemd. You talk to systemd over dbus, and systemd uh, relays this information, to re you know, uh, interact with the services. When you do a systemctl command, you're basically issuing a dbus command to the to the systemd uh, dbus socket, and dbus then reacts on it. Uh, so the idea we have is a simple, uh, you know, controller agent design where you have an agent on each node. Uh, the top one here at the top is the control node. That's where the Bluetooth controller runs. And then, so you, we have something that we call a state manager that knows the state of the system. Uh, you know, so the user has pressed the autopilot button. The state manager knows that the user has, you know, the state manager intercepts the signal and knows that this means I need to start all of these services, or maybe I need to start one, sem one system D uh, profile that will, that will in itself trigger the, 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 the start of all of the systems that are in this profile. Um, so the state manager is going to send a DBus message to the Bluetooth controller, which itself is going to repeat that instruction to the, to the Bluetooth agent, and the agent is going to talk to, Blue, to system D all of this over Dbus. So it's very much the same architecture that you love between you know, system CTL and, and, and system D within a single node, but here we are talking, you're talking across a different node. So instead of doing system CTL start uh, HTTPD, you're going to do Bluetooth CTL start HTTPD uh, Raspberry Pi 4. And I actually forgot if you put the service before or after the, the node name, so it may be GCTL start Raspberry Pi four HTTP. I forgot which order things are. Anyway, that's probably in the main page. Uh, that that is in the main page. So that's the uh, that is for Blue Cheese. Like you know, it allows you to have a single point of contact where you can control of all of your services across multiple nodes. The Second element that we've brought towards to is something that we call a QM. Uh, it's also something that is referred to in this industry as mixed criticality. And it's the idea that you may be within a single system able to run uh, functionally safe applications and non-functionally safe applications. So application ACIL, the functional safety has four different level of uh, um, you know, criteria, ACIL A to ACIL D. ACIL uh, D is the highest one, and A the lowest one. Uh, and then you have the non-functionally safe application. Those are called QM applications, simply, quality managed. 
And the fact is, you don't want to have interaction between both. You don't want to, you know, you're running on the highway at 130 kilometers per hour, sorry, we're in Europe. Um, you have in autopilot and you suddenly switch on the radio and that crushes your autopilot. That's not exactly a behavior you want to have. Uh, you cannot have, you know, uh, a non-FUSA application, so you cannot have application that, inter that are interfering with the, the FUSA ones. Um, so one of the way we've, uh, we've set up about that is, of course, to use containers. But to be able to use containers in a way that is also easy for people that are not familiar with containers, uh, in a way that is, you know, you could, you could take every container files and every systemd service files that speaks about the container and, and, and carefully handcraft it and says, well, these are the exact arguments that I want to do and so on. And that will be a very complex system just to even comprehend, like, all, I have all of these QM applications, I need to design how much CPU they can access, how much memory they have access, how much network interface they can access. And that's gonna be very hard just for, you know, for a good engineer, for a good architect to comprehend. So one way to simplify this was, we created a big container that we call the QM container. That, is a, that, is, that doesn't have a container image, it's actually running from the root file system directly. And we put all of the QM applications in there. And that QM container offers the, the, you know, offers the isolation mechanism for everything that runs in Unis, which means under that QM container here, we are running systemd, a different systemd instance than the one running on the host, which means you know, if systemd is busy to start a QM application, it's not going to be busy with uh, starting a NACL application. So the, the chances of interference between the two systemd here is no. Similar things, we are running different Podman version. We'll have, different, we'll have its own Podman here. We have a QM container that is running SU Linux. Like it's a container, we are doing nesting containerization here and nesting Podman containers and we are running SU Linux in this container. And I know how much people love running SU Linux in general and running SU Linux in container. How great is this? Like seriously, folks. Nobody applauds? Really, no? SU Linux in containers? Ah, come on, finally. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we're using everything that you would use, you would have access to using containers, but then we have, we wrap them up in a big container that's QM, and that's a, that's a voice, you know, having to do virtual machines, having to have, uh, you know, having more, more, uh, which will be more resource intensive and so on. Um, when it comes to testing things, uh, you know, if you want to, if you wanted to play with it, uh, we have a few virtual machines which are available, which are sample images. We build them for S36 and AR34. Uh, we even one of them that is built in such a way that you can run an AR64 VM on, on your x86 host. So you could actually do cross compilation kind of things where you have an AR64, an AR64 VM that you run on your x86 host and then you log into that VM and you can do uh, your AR64 builds. Uh, we also have uh, container tools, you know, we have Podmans, we have Podman images, uh, so they can, you can use Podman desktop. Uh, we have Bluechi, uh, you know, Bluechi is, is present in some of our images as well. Uh, you can find some of the artifacts here, and in fact, the, the, like exactly which image is what is present in the documentation. Um, very quickly, because we are also running out of time, uh, <laughs> and we wanted to leave room for, for some question. Um, the, the work that we're doing in automotive is part of several communities. So of course, CentOSTream is in there. And you can see this is a marketing slide, not the one we created, but I wanted to, to put it there because it actually realized that yes, CentOS is recognized by Red Hat to be one of the, co one of the communities that we're involved in and one of the important ones. Uh, but we're also part of Eclipse SDV under the Eclipse Foundation, Sophie, which was an harm-based initiative, Eliza, which is a program at the Free Software Foundation about functionally safe Linux. They actually have a keynote at FOSDEM uh, this year. Uh, we are part of ISOPASS and not of CMO as well. Um, finally, uh, I won't go through the, the, the comments on all of this. Uh, I just want to highlight the first link here, the six.centos.org slash automotive. That's where all of our documentation is, uh, you know, where you'll find the links with uh, the artifacts and you know, where you can download them and what they are. Uh, we have metrics, we have GitLab, we have, uh, Eric already mentioned that, but we have Alex Rodman Larson who is giving a talks about ComposeFS tomorrow, and Dorinda who is giving two talks uh, around, uh, you know, uh, one about Virtio in Rust using Rust VMM, and there's one about Pipewire and, uh, and QEMU. Uh, so if you have a chance, give them a call, and otherwise, uh, happy to answer your questions.
And we even have three minutes to spare. So come on. Are you allowed to mention uh, what production vehicles out there are using uh, this platform right now at this time? Uh, are we allowed to say which pla which OEMs basically is using the TI board? Yes, what cars? What, what, what cars? Uh, that's a good question. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a real gray area. <laughs> we can mention one OEM. That's the publicly announced part. Yeah, there is a, there is a public, uh, there is public knowledge that uh, Red Hat is working with General Motors on the automotive program. That's public knowledge. Uh, something we are working with Qualcomm as well, uh, that's also public knowledge. Uh, Texas Instruments as a silicon vendor is another public knowledge uh, aspect. So those are elements I can easily share. Uh, you know, which car model? Um, I have an answer, but I probably cannot give that answer on recording here. <laughs> So I have a question about the transport layer between the nodes. Uh, is it really DBus over TCP IP? Uh, the communication between the nodes is DBus over TCP IP, yeah. So if you get access to the bus, then the system is hacked? So the, there are two elements on that. The, the question about security between the nodes is something we've, which we've raised uh, during the development of this. Um, the answer we got was um, the the encryption, the communication between nodes is secured lower in the stack, so we don't have to worry about it at the application level. But we also felt like this was not necessarily the best answers if we wanted to take that project outside of this specific context. Uh, so we actually have a blog post on how you could uh, set up the same environment but using a TLS proxy on both sides to re-encrypt the communication between the nodes. And that's the, that's the, current, the current architecture that we would have, uh, would be like you have, um, so you'd have a Bluetooth controller that would have a, a, an MTLS proxy, basically, that would connect to the agent for, that would have another MTLS proxy, and then the encryption communication would be able to be achieved on that regard here. And the overhead of doing this is actually fairly negligible as well. Oh, that's also something fun. When we, when we prototype, when we profile Bluetooth, uh, we found that Bluetooth CTL was performing faster than system CTL. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but I thought that was fun enough. <laughs> Because system CTL is using SSH, so not on the local node. Oh, okay. <laughs> we yeah, literally it was you know we were speaking about an, an a handful of milliseconds here, but for some reason it was faster. <laughs> Probably just you know I don't know quicker in uh, in some aspects. But. Well, it did it. Thank you for your attention. And, uh, Thanks, guys. Yeah.